So I'm going to welcome Danielle Antonellis, um, but also Phil Deloy. So Danielle, are you there? Do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. How are great. you? Great. I'm great, thanks. And Phil, are you there too? Thanks. Yeah, I'm here. Great. Hi, Phil. Fantastic. So we're talking about fire safety in camps. So I'm going to hand over the mic to you, Phil, I believe, to start us on this. Um, and yeah, interesting topic. Over to you. Great. Uh, thanks so much. So, uh, yeah, my name is Phil Deloy. I'm a humanitarian advisor uh, to the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, formerly known as, as DFID in the UK. Um, and uh, just doing a very quick opening uh, for, for Danielle and colleagues. Um, this presentation is, is really speaking um, to the importance of fire safety research, coordination, um, and there'll be an introduction to a number of sort of growing initiatives. But, um, you know, while uh, our sector um, is, is, while there is a growing recognition of the criticality of fire risk management in humanitarian contexts, um, and there is a growing body of research uh, into a lot of different facets from a range of, of different disciplines and expertise, um, this burgeoning body exists really only in, uh, in parallel initiatives um, a, across these disparate groups. So it's, uh, it's been a real pleasure working with Danielle um, and Jim Kennedy and Liz Palmer, um, as well as Steve Jordan at FireAid, among others, um, who are all working on this and, and trying to sort of unify um, and, and uh, develop a cooperative initiative to address fire risks. So um, there remain gaps and scope for duplication of efforts, but uh, I think this is a really interesting initiative seeking to address the problem. Over to you, Danielle. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Um, it's really exciting to be here with you today, uh, virtually at least. Um, as Phil said, I'm, I'm Danielle Antonellis. I'm a fire safety engineer. Um, I spent the past six years working with AIRUP, working on building infrastructure projects around the world. Um, but I've now started a new nonprofit called Kindling, which is dedicated to supporting fire safety in humanitarian contexts and development contexts as well. Um, so I'm really excited to, to kind of help to bring this conversation together. Um, and as Phil said, we're, we're co-hosting this session with David Children International with uh, Liz Palmer, uh, Global Construction Lead, as well as Jim Kennedy. Um, so we have, I'm hoping you can all see my screen. Is it showing up okay for you all? Yeah, okay, great. So we're gonna try to get through quite a lot in a really short period of time, so bear with us. Um, but yeah, so first I'm gonna talk a bit about fire risk and fire safety in humanitarian contexts. Then Liz is gonna share a really interesting case study from Lebanon on interagency coordination. Um, and then Jim will share a bit about the research they've been doing around fire performance of plastic tarpaulins. And finally, we'll talk about opportunities to develop fire safety best practices through interagency and intercluster coordination. So global estimates of annual lives lost from fire are up to 300,000. And that means that fire kills up to five times more people than natural hazard related disasters on an annual average. According to a 2014 World Health Organization report, 2.5 times as many people die from fire each year than war-related injury. And annual fire-related injuries affect an estimated 11 million people. And as I'm sure you all know, camps are particularly vulnerable to fire. Uh, when fires occur, people's lives are at risk, shelters and community buildings are destroyed, and the few belongings affected people have are often lost. Significant investments of time, effort, and funding can literally go up in flames in a matter of minutes or hours. And unfortunately, there aren't any global statistics for fires in humanitarian settings, and the reliability of locally collected data is often questionable, but we can look to some past fire incidents to get an appreciation of the impacts. So just last week, there was a fire in an IDP camp in Borno State, Nigeria, that destroyed an estimated 1,200 tents, leaving 7,200 people without shelter. In, in Northeast Nigeria, fires in IDP camps are actually quite a frequent issue. Um, in May this year, a fire destroyed over 1,600 shelters and killed two IDPs. Just a month earlier in April, a fire killed 14 people in the camp, injured 15 others, and destroyed over 1,200 shelters. And last year, a fire in the region killed five people and further displaced almost 7,500. 
In September, global attention was on the fire in Moria Reception Identification Center on Lesbos Island in Greece. Uh, between September 8th and 10th, fires broke out in three different areas in the camp, resulting with a displacement of more than 12,000 refugees. In the weeks after the fire, people were sleeping in the streets before being relocated to a new camp on the island, um, or there were some other special circumstances of where people went. But reports indicate that the fires in Moria were caused by arson, and some might therefore say this disaster was not preventable because ignition was intentional. But I wanna be very clear that the disaster at this scale was preventable. The physical conditions in the camp and its layout are what enabled the fire to spread so rapidly and across the entire camp. And humanitarians had been warning for a long time about the overcrowded conditions. The fire shows the importance of considering fire mitigation and shelter and settlements, as well as fire response planning, among other things. So whether the ignition source is intentional or accidental, a fire can lead to a catastrophe if fire risk is not mitigated appropriately. This slide highlights some fires that have occurred in camps and informal settlements around the world. While not all informal settlements are humanitarian settings, there is much to learn around fire safety from development contexts. And also fire safety improvements contribute to resilience building of an effective population, which is obviously very critical for protracted crises in particular. So fire safety should really be considered through the humanitarian development nexus. And there are academic organizations, social businesses and nonprofits, as well as some governments researching fire safety in development contexts, which can provide some useful insights to management of fire safety in camps and camp light settings. Um, you know, we really are trying to look at how we can coordinate and learn across these different contexts. When considering the impacts of fire, it's also very critical that we consider who's the most vulnerable. Um, who's the most likely to succumb to the effects of the fire or struggle to cope with the impacts of the fire and recovery. We know that children are more vulnerable than adults and that women are often more exposed to fire due to household responsibilities such as cooking. We also know that persons with disabilities, elderly persons, children, pregnant women, and others who might require assistance to escape during a fire are more vulnerable. Improving fire safety is a matter of protection and accountability to affected populations who don't have the means to protect themselves. And while there's limited advocacy on the issue, there's even more limited guidance and tools on fire risk reduction. But why are camps so susceptible to fire? The fire triangle provides a very simple answer. All three components, fuel, heat, and oxygen are needed to have fire. In a camp, there's plenty of oxygen and many diverse heat sources or ignition sources, such as cigarettes or open flames for cooking, heating, or lighting. There's also significant fuel, shelters, NFIs, personal belongings. And unfortunately, there's no silver bullet for fire safety. A holistic approach is needed, which addresses key fire safety principles, including fire prevention, fire detection and communication, occupant protection, fire containment, and fire extinguishment. Like other disaster risks, it can be useful to consider fire safety through the four stages of the disaster cycle, mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. This is a framework we developed while I was at ERAP, which might be useful. We don't have time to go through it, so I've provided a QR code on the screen that you can use to access the full document. Um, and it does provide some recommendations on what to consider at the household or shelter settlement and host community scales. I do want to highlight a couple of things that came out of this research, which was mostly grounded in South Africa. Um, first, fire is highly socio-technical. People's decisions and behaviors have a direct impact on fire risk and fire consequences, and it's therefore very important that we acknowledge the diverse and complex socio-cultural relationships people have with fire. These relationships shape people's values, beliefs, and attitudes towards fire, and will influence their perception of fire risk and ultimately behavior. So for example, we often hear that fire is an act of God, um, indicating that people think nothing can be done about it. But there are things that we can do to improve fire safety. Secondly, it is critical we acknowledge that not all fire is bad. Uh, we use fire every day in one form or another, and in humanitarian settings, people rely on it for cooking, heating, lighting, among other things. So while we should have efforts to prevent or reduce ignition sources, eliminating fire is not possible. Instead, we need to focus on controlling it. Um, there's an old proverb I like, which is, fire is a great servant, but a bad master. So the framework can help to facilitate dialogue around fire safety, but it's only conceptual in nature, and practical tools and resources are needed to support fire risk reduction. 
So we looked at the sphere handbook to see what recommendations it has. And it does have some practical recommendations around settlement planning. Um, but furthermore, it notes that fire risk assessments should inform site planning, which raises the question, how do you actually carry out a fire risk assessment for a camp? Um, there aren't any guidance or, tool or tools for supporting humanitarian actors in carrying out fire risk assessments. And fire safety considerations are not well integrated into other assessment tools. Um, humanitarian organizations do sometimes arrange for international firefighters to fly out to a camp, however, to carry out a risk assessment and recommend ways to improve fire safety. This only happens, though, when fire is identified as a significant issue, usually after a pretty large fire event, um, and where resources and timelines allow. And while this approach can be very beneficial, uh, the outcomes are highly reliant on the expert judgment of the fire specialists that fly out to the camp. Their level of understanding of local context and what is and what is not appropriate and achievable in humanitarian settings is critical. And there are very few people with the relevant knowledge and expertise globally. And Liz will touch on um, one group that has the relevant expertise in this, Operation Florian. So in general, what is the current state of fire safety resources, knowledge, and practice in the humanitarian sector? Unfortunately, the truth is that we don't really know. Uh, coordinated efforts have not been made to collect lessons from past events and learning from context-specific fire safety programming that has been done. There's a need to gather evidence and, re and insights to describe the current state of fire safety in the humanitarian sector, so we can learn from what has been done in the past and identify gaps and opportunities for improving fire safety in the future. As a cross-cutting issue, fire safety needs coordination between agencies, clusters, and often with the local government. There are specific aspects of fire safety which are relevant to each cluster. Some examples are shown here. While protective actions can be taken independently by each cluster, a well-coordinated system of fire safety should be the goal. Camp coordination and camp management can play a critical role in developing new ways to support interagency and intercluster coordination for fire safety. I'm going to hand over to Liz Palmer to talk about um, the work that they've done in Lebanon to save the children and operation beforehand. Great, thank you very much, Danielle. I hope everyone can hear me. Hello from Cape Town, South Africa. So today I'm, I'm just going to give five minutes on uh, a massive project that we did in, uh, in uh, Lebanon, which was actually started in uh, 2017, 2016. So maybe we can go to the next slide, please, Danielle. Um, where uh, Save the Children had been monitoring and tracking some of the, the bigger risks associated with fire in Lebanon and realized that in, in a review at the time of about 2016, 2017, there were very many fires in the informal tented settlements. So on the left-hand side, you can see some numbers there in terms of the fires that were, were seen in, in the buildings, as well as the fires that were seen in, tent, in the tented settlements. And the biggest critical issue that was really a catalyst for us was the loss of life of which you can see here, the numbers were stagger staggeringly high with coming to, to children under the age of five. And it, it, it highlights Danielle's point about their inability to escape and their higher prevalence of being alone in the shelters, probably knocking over um, uh, 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 candles. And uh, so that was a big, um, a, a big catalyst for Save the Children to initiate what we called the fire risk reduction assessment for refugee and vulnerable host communities in Lebanon. And we were most fortunate at that time to have a partnered with Operation Florian, of which um, Laura Hurst is here with us today uh, to represent them. Operation Florian is a fantastic um, kind of combined group of, of firefighters as well as researchers. And I think they've probably got connections in just about every uh, sector, um, uh, part of the sector where um, we have, uh, they came to, the, to, to Lebanon and undertook what was effectively a nationwide fire risk assessment to determine what the gaps were. And as a result of their recommendations, which was a fabulous body of work, a number of um, key recommendations were identified. One of the biggest gaps was the lack of coordination and the lack of information sharing from the bottom up, all stakeholders, from the children, the, the, the community members, refugees and host, all the NGO and, and UN workers, as well as linking to the Lebanese Civil Defense and the Lebanese Red Cross, which works outside of the UN uh, coordination mechanism. And they took it right up to the government level. Um, so the coordination aspect was, was so, so critical and had been a massive gap in terms of sharing information. For example, uh, a very good example of this, which you know we as, as humanitarian actors were all having our fire safety meetings in Becca, 
And each, each agency was doing a different thing. Some people were distributing buckets of sand, which were being turned into ashtrays. Other people were distributing fire extinguishers, but some were water, some were foam. There was no training. There was no information in the camp as to where the fire, the, the fire extinguishers were. And it, it, it was a mess. And on top of that, if there was a fire, the Lebanese civil defense that does the fire um, response didn't know about the P code system and where those GPS locations were of the different sites. So they could drive around and anyone who's been to Becca will know exactly what I mean. You can drive around in circles for ages before you actually got to the fire, by which point in time it was too late. Um, and of course, then one of the other key activities was fire safety tools and resources. So putting together across the board awareness raising. Um, and then by 2018, they had developed uh, national guidelines for what that is standing for as fire prevention protection and response recovery I can't remember what it's in the next slide and also the development of the Becker fire risk mitigation strategy for IS in, is the um, uh, informal settlements and SSB is substandard buildings so as we mentioned the coordination aspect was one of the key aspects that was highlighted as a gap in uh, in the coordination of uh, response for fire safety next slide is um, telling us about the um, pre prevention and preparedness. Sorry, that's what the two Ps are. So the strategy was set up with regards to SOP and standards. They developed for the informal settlements firefighting kit distribution criteria that all agencies adhered to, as well as a firefighting technique and a fire break technique so that the, the refugees themselves were aware about the spacing of buildings and the requirements associated with fire breaks. Um, it was very, very extensive gender focused approach where we, we, had, we ran focus group discussions with all um, gender um, groups. And then we put in place a lot more information around where the fire extinguishers were, how to use it, when it needs servicing, et cetera. Next slide, please. Um, under the prevention and preparedness, as I mentioned, there was a massive amount of training. So this was put into place for men, women, boys and girls, taking into account, as Danielle mentioned, where we have opportunity for response, who should be leading the evacuation and the information sharing, who's raising the alarm, as well as uh, fire wardens, training in how to respond to contain the fire, training in how to react to cooking, so that would be for the women and the children, and also for the children particularly, um, looking at teaching children how to, how to live, how to raise the alarm and how to escape. So the all aspects of society were, were considered in, in this process, and it was very much done as a community-led response. That's me and my five minutes. Um, so we'll just quickly run through the last two slides. Um, we had, uh, as part of the response, um, multi-stakeholder approach, they looked at the community-level response, the household-level response, and also the child-friendly uh, response, which was obviously from, say, the children's point of view, a, a key focal area, specifically based on those high numbers and, of course, our mandate. So an extensive amount of awareness raising was put into place, both in the informal settlements, but also considering the residential and non-residential buildings. And I think it's very important to mention here that it is a camp response and what we're seeing more and more and more of these urban camps where people are living in buildings uh, with many, many households associated with, with that, uh, that structure. And then, <laughs> final slide, please. Uh, I can just see one's, one's comment. Um, so yes, and we had an extensive amount of post uh, monitoring and evaluation, which Steve, uh, he very sweetly came and joined this presentation in the Shelter Cluster the other day. He said that was one of the things that was hugely lacking. And certainly from our point of view, when we started this project, we just didn't know how bad it was. Now we know, and we also know how much better things are. So this has really led to learning cycles and improving, um, improving the, the, the response that people are doing, but also just the basis of monitoring the fire extinguishers and refilling, getting levels of information that's two-way feedback from communities, etc., has really, really helped uh, in the improvements. And the bottom right picture you can see there is actually testing a fire break between two shelters, which is another thing that we looked at was how do we improve the shelter response? So that one side can be protected from from the other and stop the spread. Um, final slide, I think. No, nope, that's not me. I'm can now I can hand over to uh, Phil. I just want to say thank you very much, everyone, for your interest. If anybody would like to receive the, um, the report that was developed by for Operation Florian, I'd be happy to share it. Um, I might give it to one. She can put it on the website. Thanks so much. Uh Thanks very much, Liz. Um, yeah, just a, a really brief one from me, uh, turning over to Jim in a moment. Um, a lot of, I think Jim is 
probably pretty well known in the CCCM cluster as well as Shelter uh, and elsewhere. Um, we uh, at FCDO, uh, following a prompt from um, from Operation uh, Florian and, and Fire Aid, commissioned him to put together a really extensive report on uh, on fire retardants in plastic sheeting. Hence the uh, slightly less than than glamorous uh, UK hate badge uh, in front of you now. Um, FCDO is now acting to to move on those findings and, and others that have come later by uh, by like likely adopting a fire retardant spec in all our plastic cheating. Um, just for the record, we really don't want that to be a distraction from all of the other um, elements that are required to to really meaningfully mitigate fire risk. Uh, but without further ado, over to Jim. Thanks. Thank you, Phil. Uh, and if we can move to the next slide. Um, so I'm basically just going to share two uh, very quick slides with everybody. Uh, as Phil said, uh, I was working with Phil and uh, the rest of his team uh, to look into uh, not just uh, whether it was possible to have um, fire retardant plastic sheeting, plastic uh, tarpaulin, but how effective that might actually be. Um, so I just want to share two slides with some overall insights uh, from, from the longer report. And I think firstly, just to follow on from, um, from Phil's last comment, and just to echo that, um, I think echoes are often quieter than the original sound, but this time I wanted to make it <laughs> louder or longer, that um, fire retardancy in plastic sheeting um, through the addition of chemical compounds might make a contribution to fire safety in camps, but should not be seen as a complete solution to itself. And I think coming from a, a camp management perspective, uh, I'm probably singing to the choir at this point and uh, very much, uh, if I could see all of your faces, I'd hope that I'd be seeing them nodding away. Um, that the worry is not only that plastic sheeting, fire retardant or not, uh, has a minimum effect, in many camps, uh, especially those where they're overcrowded, overdensified, and where most of the shelter or other structures are actually built with even more flammable materials, cardboard, thatch, um, but also that there is a risk that um, with fire retardancy in plastic sheeting, it might divert attention and resources from larger questions of fire safety overall, from uh, training, learning, uh, behavior, nudging, things like that. Um, and generally, we're still at a position, as uh, both Danielle and Lisa said, that there's, there's too little evidence um, to provide confident guidance on some of the other trade-offs, including environmental impact, including just the durability of the plastic sheeting, the ability to pl for plastic sheeting to still fulfill its core function of giving safe, dignified shelter, as well as questions of just the logistics and costing which might be involved. Next slide, please. And just to go through two more very important points, um, even within that question of fire retardancy for plastic sheeting, uh, ignoring the bigger questions of fire safety more generally uh, in camps and sites, it's very difficult to actually uh, find a way forwards to convincingly monitor and control that. Um, part of the challenge is that the major producers actually refuse to tell anybody how they're doing it and what the chemical compounds are. Um, and this means that you can't actually test to see what they've put in. You can only test for what happens if uh, a plastic sheet actually ignites. Um, but that sort of testing and the testing to do uh, that would be necessary for whole shelters or whole tents or things like that is very, very difficult to actually achieve in the field where the controls might actually need to be. And now I'm heading, handing back to Liz, uh, sorry, to, to, to Danielle. Thank you, Jim. So in summary, our goal is to develop best practices to reduce deaths, injuries, and losses from fire and humanitarian context through interagency and intercluster coordination. 
Um, we can think of several ways to move the needle, such as some of the, the things you can see in the slide here. Um, I'll just read out a couple of them. Um, so we really do want to research the current state of fire safety in the sector, um, collect existing evidence and insights from the sector and identify gaps. Um, there definitely has been some really nice programming that's happened around fire safety in different contexts. So we want to learn from what's been done in the past. Um, we want to think about what, you know, what does interagency coordination look like for fire safety, um, whether or not a guideline is the right thing or not, um, I don't know, but we want to help create something that can enable coordination. Um, we want to look at fire safety training, uh, such as mobile training guides for field staff. And ultimately, we'd really like to have a toolkit where you can go to with different methods and tools, in particular for fire risk assessment, so we're not as reliant on international experts flying in and flying out um, to do assessments in camps, um, as well as collection of case studies, training materials, and advocacy. Um, and finally, it's really critical that we think about how can we integrate fire safety considerations into existing guidance and tools used by the various clusters. Um, I know fire safety is one of many things that need to be considered in the field, so how can we make that easier to consider and integrate this into, into the tools that you're already using. Um, so to do this, we really need support and input from all the different clusters and agencies and a mechanism that enables peer-to-peer -peer learning and engagement with a wide range of stakeholders, including fire safety specialists, such as fire safety engineers or firefighters that can bring some of that more technical fire safety knowledge into these contexts. Um, and while we, while we don't yet know how this group will be formalized, we are trying to develop some sort of interagency or intercluster working group for fire safety. Um, and we really hope that you wanna get involved. So in order to kind of move, to, move forward, we really wanna hear from you. Um, we want to hear how worried you may or may not be about fire and humanitarian settings, uh, what your agency already does to improve fire safety. Um, and in this survey with the link here, um, we are also asking if you have any resources that you can share on fire safety then to please uh, send them along to us. Um, and also we wanna know what you need to, to better consider fire safety in your work. Um, and through the survey, you can also sign up for email updates and express interest if you wanna get more actively involved. Um, in this work. Um, so that's really it from us. I know we only have a couple minutes, um, trying to stay on the timing, <laughs> but wanted to say thank you for joining us. Uh, here's our contact information if you want to reach out to us directly. Um, and if we can sneak in any questions in the little bit of time left, then that would be great. <laughs> Daniel, thank you so much. Um, and also to Jim and Phil and Liz, a fantastic presentation and perfect timing. You've come in with two minutes to spare, despite there being four of you, so well done. Um, and a huge amount of information again. There were a couple of points in the chat. One was um, uh, highlighting the problem with fires caused by faulty electrical equipment in, in Iraq. And the other was a question about what type of fire breaks were being used, which I think Liz has already jumped on. So thanks for that, Liz. I guess with only one minute to go, I think what's important is to check and see if we can take that uh, survey monkey uh, survey that you've put up there and, and get it onto the website for this event overall to try to get as many people as we can because presumably you want a broader response as possible. There are about 45 people online at the moment but hopefully we can get it to some more so I guess that's one to one just to, to, to emphasize that we could do that and I think to everyone as we don't have any more time for questions please do reach out directly to our four speakers here um, and then other than that, just to say thank you very much for taking the time and putting together such an informative presentation. So thank you. Thank you very much.